Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Friendly Ex-Muslim Podcast. I'm your host, Abdullah Slamia. We are now on episode 90. Episode 90, and today I'm joined by Deborah, Debbie. Debbie and me actually have an interesting connection, which I will now tell you guys. I was surprised to find that the the very person I'm I'm interviewing today was someone that knows a Muslim that I was debating with. So I'm just going to introduce the backstory here. Going back to 2015, I guess, 2016, around this time when I left Islam, I was talking to a member of Hizb Tahrir. His name, oh, I won't say his name. So this individual who I was talking to, he and I were debating. So for those of you who don't know, what is Hizb Tahrir? Hizb Tahrir is an Islamist organization, an organization that wants to bring back the caliphate. Right, so you 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 wonder, well, didn't didn't someone bring back the caliphate, i.e., ISIS? Well, they have a different <laughs> interpretation of how the caliphate should be, or whatever. But they want to bring back the caliphate in all of its core, meaning, you know, all of the hudud punishments, meaning like chopping off hands, you know, apostate killing, all of that fun stuff. They want it all back. So I was discussing with this uh, with this person. Hizb Tahrir has an interesting way of doing things in that they like to debate, they like to engage, they like to attack, they like to heckle Muslim speakers at the event. So they'll show up at like Muslim events and they'll start arguing with them. A um, lot of fun stuff. So it turns out this very person who told me that by leaving Islam, I'm going to end up homeless, destitute, you know, addicted to drugs living on the street, the same person who said this to me, it turns out his own wife left Islam. So this is going to be a very interesting story. Um, and uh, we'll, try to, we'll try not to get you know, into too personal details. So if, if I ask you anything that's like, you know, not, you don't want to talk about, feel free just to say, I don't want to talk about that. Um, <clears throat> did, I, uh, did I describe his with Tahrir correctly? You were, yeah. I guess you were a part of it as well, sort of? Yeah, or? yeah, I, I I participated as much as I could. I didn't become a full member because as soon as you do, then you're really responsible for a lot of things. And I had no time because I was just having lots of children. <laughs> yes, you were doing the ideal um, Muslim wife uh, role, which is yes. having kids, taking care of Duty. kids and all that, right? Yeah, exactly. So so let's go back to, um, let's go back to the beginning. Like... Um, it turns out you actually not just uh, you're not just the you're not just the the ex-wife of this individual we're talking about, but you also know my wife. You spoke to her before. Yeah, yeah. I became friends with her on Facebook uh, before I left. Um, my ex uh, wanted me to become friends with her and like meet up with her to um, you know be a good influence in her life because I guess he had been arguing with you and did <laughs> like that. But um, yeah, so we were just Facebook friends as um, converts kind of thing. Yeah, so yeah. so basically he wanted you to save her from the evil Murtad. Yeah. Because I was so a lot, I've seen this a lot, like when, when it's not, I mean, it's, people are not usually public because of this reason. But in this case, you, ha you, had a, you had a dynamic where you had like a public apostate with a muslim woman mm -hmm. and so you had a lot of white knighting going on you had a lot of muslim men that wanted to jump in and save her from from me i right? wanted to save um and i'm i'm actually wondering if you might you might have actually gone through some similar situation but because you're the woman it'd be a little bit different um in my case she had people like muslim women telling her to leave me because well obviously she's supposed to leave me because of the wall um, you can't be married to a non-Muslim, right? But on top of that, because of the kids, so so these Muslim women who were friends of my wife were thinking, well, you should leave him because he's a bad example for the kids. What I didn't understand, and I still don't get it, is I would still be a part of the lives. I'm still the biological father, and I have every right to see them and to to be okay. a part of their lives and to parent them. So. I guess from their perspective, maybe they're thinking if she was with another Muslim man 
and I was a little bit more distant, there'd be more power over the kids in terms of shaping them. Um, I think in my case, I'm lucky because the kids were, you know, relatively young still, so still open-minded. I find that when people, uh, when kids are a little bit older, you know, say in the like teens, late teens, like 17, yeah. 18, and the Muslim, it becomes much harder to detach from that. And that's what I've heard from friends like Hassan Radwan and others that, you know, with, with older kids, a lot of the times when the parents or one of the parents leave Islam, it, kids are confused, but a lot of times they just remain Muslim. Whereas when they're younger, they're still not totally, the minds are not totally made up yet. And, you know, that's how we are as human beings, right? Like the, yeah. the reason why most people follow a religion is because their parents made them into that religion, right? Yeah, exactly. You grow up as, as a Hindu or you grow up as a Christian or a Muslim, typically because your parents told you, this is what you're gonna follow so after that you know we've obviously we obviously do that for a reason we think this is best for the kids so we're teaching our kids that oh yeah there's only one god or you know god is you know in all of these different manifestations or god came down as a man we're trying to do what's best for our kids what we think is best for our kids but at the end of the day um that you know a lot of times even if it's wrong it's very difficult to get rid of that sort of brainwashing right yeah yeah. So in your case, you were you were born uh, in, into a Mennonite, was it Mennonite family? Yep. Yeah. My family's Mennonite. <clears throat> so, so can my, you tell us a little bit about that? My parents grew up um, uh, like Mennonite with, you know, horse and buggy and no electricity. They, they grew up in villages in Mexico, actually. There's like uh, a lot of colonies throughout South America and Mexico. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. they were born there and um, they migrated to Canada. And they raised us like in the city, so they wanted to give their kids a better life. So they came here and learned English and stuff. But the religion was still a big part of our family, so we went to church and, and learned the Bible and stuff. So w would you consider yourself to have been like um, like a religious? I guess Mennonites are Christian, right? So yeah, it's Christian? yeah, it's very it's like Lutheran kind of thing. Um, they broke off. <clears throat> They're like the pacifists, so they don't believe in uh, joining any army or being part of any wars, like mm -hmm. under any circumstance. So they're oh, yeah. just very peaceful and want to keep to themselves, kind of thing. So, so you were, you know, living your life as. Um, were you would you consider yourself to be been practicing, or was it more like, oh yeah, this is just something that um, I was raised in? Yeah, the, kind of that, and we would just like do the holidays and go to church on Sundays sometimes. I became more religious as a teenager. I started going to church on my own and joining all kinds of activities and ended up joining an evangelical church and things uh -huh. like that. And oh, went yeah. on to Bible college after high school and everything. Oh, you literally so, dive deep in, into yeah, the whole thing. Well, and that's how I ended up leaving Christianity is when I started learning how the Bible actually is not this magical book that <laughs> formed. So wow. yeah. I, I left Christianity after Bible college. I took a year of that and uh, everything fell apart. Um, I I wasn't really atheist, only that I had just left the, my religion. So I, I really fully intended to learn about other religions too, but I was done with like throwing everything into Christianity. So um, that's during that search is when I met uh, my ex who was a very very practicing Muslim at the time and working for this organization. So um, I guess the, that aspect of it intrigued me. So I decided to learn about this religion that I knew nothing about. Oh, interesting. Can you say how you met? Is that? Yeah, we, well, I mean, we met on a dating website. So I guess, um, you know, Muslims do it too. But he was very clear when we met in person that he's a Muslim and they don't really date. So, mm. you know, what Muslims do is they meet up and talk about marriage. <laughs> I was like, that, oh. That is, that is different because no. I was taught as a Muslim, you have to go to the parents. You don't, you don't go and meet people directly because of the, um, the inherent risks of like, you know, falling for someone or something like that, right? Yeah. But I think there's different rules, though, when Muslim men go for non-Muslim women. Oh. So this is what I'm learning, is that there's, like, different rules. Like, they, you know, kind of, like, a lot of things go out the window when they're dealing with non-Muslim women for some mm -hmm. stupid reason. Of course, like, everything's for the man in that, that religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah. 
so that's what got me on the path of learning about that religion. And um, th he was very active, um, like doing his own stuff is like a lot of debates with public debates and lectures at the universities where they like publicize it, um, talk about the war and, and how, you know, the West is attacking Muslims on purpose. And, you know, just this kind of history that I was never taught. So I was very intrigued with learning like the other side of things. So there was many things that um, really led me to it. And um, I found some like fancy websites like explaining Islam and all the scientific miracles. And, you know, so I was like, wow, these are all these things that, you know, Christianity didn't have that it's very clear, you know, you don't have to like doubt anything, everything is very clear. So, um, yeah, I, I decided to go for it and thought, you know, I could see where this goes. But this was like a year after I had met him. We we had met up and then we just kind of like kept in touch over like email and stuff because um, he ended up moving to another city doing his stuff anyway. So, but yeah, we ended up getting married and I just like took off, and left where I was living and um, dove right into full Islam. Like it was- um, and everything. Yeah, so we ended up just meeting at somebody's house and doing the Islamic marriage where you just have like yeah. the witnesses and um, somebody brought a hijab and a baya for me to put on. And there was a sister there to like teach me what my, I have to do. And um, I didn't even realize that like he was part of this organization like kind of like a a meal like, right is he like no the, he wasn't he was just more of like he was a higher up because he had been a member for a long time he was very active um but i didn't realize like that he was like he had a lot of influence so he had to appear like anyway he made it the impression that i needed to uh look the part so like start wearing right. hijab right away like there was no delaying in that and um, so, yeah, just getting involved like this and um, uh, meeting these other women and uh, got pregnant right away and um, just went all in, like, we're just going to do this. So, yeah. and I really just started practicing with these other Muslims and doing everything, um, only learning Arabic and uh, Quran and memorizing Quran and Tajweed and um, all the things to, you know, learn about this religion, you know. And um, uh, so it was about seven years. One second. So that, that, just to jump in for a second, that sounds, you know, unfortunately kind of similar to what my, my wife went through as well, because she was a fresh convert. In her case, she converted before meeting me, and then we got married, and then I was like this religious, zealous convert, right? I mean, I was like gung-ho. I was like already, you know, causing problems in my family and <laughs> getting my parents mad at me uh, for being so religious and, you know, telling everyone how they should live their lives. And then, of course, I'm getting married, so I expect my wife to wear a hijab. I expect no music in the house. I mean, you know, you have this fresh convert, barely knows about Islam, and she's being told no music. I just imagine, like, it's like, I mean, you <laughs> you know exactly, you went yeah. through the exact same yeah. thing, right? So um, it can be tough. I mean, it can be incredibly tough. Um, I would say, I would say, in, in terms of you know your ex, he was he being he has a lot of leadership characteristics. He's yeah. he's very charismatic. He's very um, he's. I mean, I don't want to praise him too much, but he's he's convincing. Like he's not yeah. he's not an idiot, right? He's yeah. a smart guy. He knows what he's talking about, and we we'll get into. I want to get into some of the conversations we had a little bit later. Yeah, uh, when we get to your story. Uh, but it's not surprising that like, it's like even like you're probably not the only one that was convinced by him because he he's probably convinced a lot of other people to convert to Islam too. I wouldn't be surprised. Anyway. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's the thing. I got to know that he was quite influential and, um, uh, you know, I would meet like fans of his everywhere we went, like he was doing khutbahs everywhere. And um, yeah, so there's other people that really hated him or that really loved him because he was being controversial you know <laughs> but a lot of people were like what are you doing go back to your country or yeah. they're just like this is great we need more of this so it's it's basically calling muslims to political islam and, yeah. and where, where is he 
where is he from? He's Canadian, born and raised here. Okay, so go yeah. back to your country means go back yeah. to <laughs> London, like, Ontario. Yeah, don't, yeah, exactly. Don't live in, yeah. <laughs> don't live in this country and enjoy the freedoms if you're going, you know, preaching against it kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, um, it, yeah. It's challenging though, like this, just uh, as a little bit of a diversion, it's a challenging topic because you have people like him that are using liberalism and democracy and freedom of religion and freedom of speech to fight to take away those very things. Yeah. Right? And that's the thing. Like they use that as um, <clears throat> the, you know, they're like, you know, we have free speech and we're using the free speech. But now when we try to use free speech to like criticize Islam, it's now we're crossing the line. So it's just, uh, it's not fair, the double standard that we're facing. It's, it's crazy because if we get the world that he wants, like me and you both would be executed. Yeah. But he is using, you know, they are using, and the funny thing is, I mean, his Tahrir is actually banned in many Muslim countries, right? Yeah, it, lots. Well, because the goal of his Tahrir is to, overthrow a muslim government through military coup it's like very clear so they just want to find um, a muslim majority army of a fairly large country out there and um you know if you turn the, all the generals like they could take over the government and start up their own little hilafa right so of course those countries will ban his material because if that's what their goal is they're like nope like and they throw them in jail as soon as they do anything so it's it's not like it's serious business for these countries, you know. Why but, why do you yeah. think? Um, do you know that like do you, do you understand the world theological difference or like the what's the, what do they what's the problem with ISIS? Do you know why they ISIS don't like was uh, they were considered as uh, they weren't doing it the right way. They um, they were killing too many Muslims. Like they were going on and killing Shias as apostates. They were killing like. So they're like, you know, that, that's not the right way to do it. Um, I know the Hizib went to ISIS and tried to correct them. And they were also uh, punished by ISIS. Um, I heard that they had been executed by ISIS. So, so the interesting, yeah. interesting thing is what ISIS does is they say everybody else is a munafik. And that's why they kill them. Because they don't, right. they don't want to kill Muslims either. Like They don't want to kill Muslims. So they say, oh, you're not Muslim. Therefore, exactly, exactly. And and that's what I mean. Like, when you look at it, like any sort of political ideology in theory, and you, you know, you sit there and try to draw out the outcome of it, it's never the same as, as when you implement that. So when you see ISIS on the ground, that's, that's actual Muslims trying to put together a, an Islamic state. Like, exactly. we're, like, that is like, we got proof of what that would look like on the ground. Like that, you know, all the fallacies or you can go and say, oh, that's not from that hadith. Everyone has their inter interpretations and there's always going to be that problem. Yeah. And they were doing everything according to Islam. So I like you can't tell me that that is nothing that is not Islam at all. Like they were going yeah. as, as deeply as they could. Yeah. So it's just proves that you you can always have, a, a, you know, a lovely theory uh, for a, a social system. But. Yeah, it's um, I would say it's one interpretation, one possible interpretation of Islam. I wouldn't say it's the only one. I wouldn't. I would definitely not say it's un-Islamic. I would definitely not say it has nothing to do with Islam. I mean, Muslims would argue it's un-Islamic based on the various interpretations. Some of the things they're doing is un-Islamic, but at the same time, no Muslim should be able to like say with a straight face this has nothing to do with Islam. It's called the Islamic State, for God's yeah, sake. I mean, exactly. They're flying much... the flag. Like, they were being as much as an Islamic State as you could possibly get. Like, yeah. the I know the Hizab, they say that, you know, the sign of a real Hilafa um, is that they will go straight to Palestine and liberate them. Like, that will be the first thing on the agenda. So the fact that ISIS was not doing that, that that was um proof that they're not like a real <laughs> yeah they're just like a bunch of gang thugs you know so there's a checklist of things um yeah you're doing it wrong guys you're doing it wrong uh, didn't uh go to palestine okay no, 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 no. but yeah I like, mean, yeah 
you, you know, there's a beautiful book I read called The The Way of Strangers by Graham Wood. He's an award-winning journalist. He 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 interviewed a lot of like Al Qaeda and ISIS and Taliban, and he he kind of specializes in this. And you know, he he talked about he literally gets in the mind, and I think me and you would understand these jihadis better than anyone else. These people, they literally think if they join ISIS, that angels are going to come down and they're going to reestablish Muhammad's Medina in the yeah. 21st century. They they think it doesn't matter that the entire world is against them. I mean, they're not thinking logically, rationally in any sense. There's just angels are going to come. Yeah. And like people that were interviewed that went to ISIS, a lot of them were disillusioned because there was no angels. I mean, things were bad, right? Like, like yeah. really bad. And so when they came back, it was just, well, they were just idiots to go in the first place, but they were expecting to come back to like London or England or Canada, Australia. They're not coming back. They've they've basically declared war on the country. Yeah. You know, they can't come back. Right? It's just, but they were thinking like naively. And just to give another example of, of Muslims thinking this, there's a famous story, and Yasakari talked about this, of a man who was born who called himself the Mahdi. And he had the exact name that Muhammad said would be the name of the Mahdi. I forget what it was now. Muhammad ibn Abdullah or something. I forget. I don't remember. And this man was like a religious man in Saudi. He started telling people, I'm the Mahdi. If people don't know what Mahdi means, Mahdi means the guide. He's like the imam that's going to come before Jesus comes. And he's going to reestablish, you know, put the Muslims back in. And, you know, even Shias are waiting for Mahdi as well, the 12th imam to come back. Yeah. But the Sunnis are also waiting. And so... This guy, he managed to convince a lot of learned scholarly people in Saudi, including at the University of Medina, including Yasser Qadi said he knows how, like, like smart people that were convinced that maybe this guy is really the Mahdi. And guess what happened? This guy, he, they snuck in. They made a little mini army. They snuck in weapons. I think what they did is they hid it inside caskets, pretended they were doing a janaza or something. I, I don't know the exact details. They brought a bunch of weapons into the haram, the most sacred area of the Kaaba. And they like killed a bunch of people and took it over. They took the Kaaba hostage, claiming to be the Mahdi. And of course, they got slaughtered by the Saudis. Okay, <laughs> yeah, they were, exactly. That's it. Like prophecy over <laughs> failed prophecy. I'm laughing because I shouldn't be laughing. But the point is, at that point, it became obvious to everyone. He's dead. It's kind of like when yeah. Jesus was supposed to be the Messiah and then he was executed. And now people are like, uh, Messiah is dead. He's supposed to be the, the ruler, right? Like the same analogy. Yeah. He was supposed to be the king. Jesus was supposed to be the king of the Jew, of all of. And of course, he got executed by the Romans. And so now a new theology was born out of that. But in this case, it just died. It was like, that was the end of it. Nope, he was a false yeah. man. He wasn't the Mahdi. Um, but it, this is what religious like thinking can do to your brain. I know. It can infect your brain and, and you know short circuit all of the rationality and thinking. And and I, I I I I hate to say it, but I have sympathy for people that fell for this. But obviously, there's no going back. You've crossed the line. Like at this point, you've you're involved in like a terror state or whatever. You cannot come back after that. Like there's no coming back. I'm not saying like I have sympathy on them from that perspective, but I understand like what they were thinking, right? Obviously, yeah. they there's no going back from that but but his bataria is you know in my my opinion what they're trying to do is very dangerous because what they're trying to do is make the world back into the seventh century right right they want to bring back this evil uh theocratic nasty system that would have dhimmis like kufar and disbelievers as second class citizens mm -hmm. right and yeah and yeah. slavery would be back oh, yeah. and everything like they they would be declaring jihad on countries. They would be, I don't know, like they that's their ideal world, and it's that whole self fulfilling pro prophecy. You know, they everybody's working towards it, and they all believe the promise that Islam will rule the entire world one day. So, I mean, it's just. Um, it's not hard to convince good Muslims of it, you know, because they believe in that promise. So it, it's, it is dangerous. Can we talk a little bit more about your Muslim life? So like you said, you got married right away to this like high ranking, let's call him high ranking member of Hezbollah Tahrir, um, this Islamist group. What was your life? What, what, what was your life like? 
Um, <clears throat> we moved uh, around quite a bit. Um, he was always doing activities um, uh, for the group. Um, there was always um, online stuff and um, events at different universities and doing kutbahs and um, all the halakhas that they hold for members to um, learn. There's like a bunch of books you have to learn. Um, so I was always learning these along the way as well. It was just part of my Islam. So um, it was just that, and that was always the, the top priority. Like, um, you know, if the Hizb told us to move to a certain place in order to do something, like we would have to do what they did. Uh, CSIS, the uh, Canadian Intelligence Agency, they followed us everywhere we moved. So every time we'd move, they'd knock on the door. They were like, why'd you move here? What are you guys doing? So, so we knew we were always being watched. Um, it, 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 Canada does see them as an issue, you know, but um, all they can do is kind of watch, right? Yeah, because they, they technically are not breaking the laws. Right. Right. They're not actually telling people to do anything. They're, they're trying to do something dangerous, but it's, it's sort of uh, theoretical, right? I mean, that's what they yeah. always say. Oh, no, we're not saying anyone should kill apostates today. We're saying in an Islamic state. Right? Yeah, exactly. So um, as, as your life as a Muslim woman, um, you were, would you say your focus was like raising your kids Islamically, teaching them Islam, um, being involved in halakas and yeah. um, learning about Islam? What, like, what else was it? Was is that, is that what you mainly yeah. did for many yeah. years? Yep, just having children, um, ha doing all the halakas with other women, um, getting to know um, all the different women in the mosque. Uh, we homeschooled um, with our kids, so um, just teaching Islam only. Um, we planned on doing hijra, moving to the Middle East. Um, we were told like that we should just, you know, always be ready like to just move quickly. So, um, yeah, because, uh, you know, he knew that my family would try to stop us, obviously, from moving to the Middle East. And he wanted to, you know, continue his work. So we would probably be trying to overthrow some governments out there, <laughs> which is not safe for the kids. Yeah. So I was clear, like I was afraid for my kids as, you know, as I'm raising them and they're getting older. And, you know, so I was always... Um, afraid of, of taking them somewhere foreign where I'd be trapped, really. Like, I wouldn't be able to just leave like I did here. Like, it was so already hard Muslim, enough to leave here. But, as a Muslim, you were thinking this? Um, kind of. I just knew that it was not safe. I thought, I didn't think I can't leave him. I just knew yeah. that I would be a lot more trapped. Um, I would probably have to stay home all the time there. And... Um, and my kids just wouldn't be safe. I just, you know, they had health issues and stuff. So, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so for so those of you who are joining now, who missed the beginning, uh, I'm speaking with Debbie. She's an ex-Muslim, ex-Mennonite. Uh, actually, ex and ex Muslim in that order, and uh, now atheist. I have shared the link to her channel, so do check out her channel. She doesn't have any videos yet, but let's let's subscribe to her channel, and um, she's going to be creating some content, which will be the you know, obviously on this topic as well. Yeah. So definitely check out her channel. Do join it, and uh, Debbie and I have an interesting um, shared history in that we. You know, I I was talking to her ex husband before she left Islam, and now that she's left Islam, it just shows that you know more and more people are leaving Islam. Leaving Islam is becoming normalized, and that's that's our goal. We just, you know, any religion, any sort of view, sh people should be free to ascribe to it. And the funny thing is, Islam on one hand does say, you know, everyone's free. I mean, freedom of religion. There's no, they don't say freedom of religion. They say there's no compulsion in the religion which you would think means anyone can leave it if they want to. And at the same time, if Islam was a compulsion, then it would be useless because Islam means to submit. Yeah. So how can you have a religion that claims that, you know, it, it's submission at the same time that claims no compulsion at the same time kills people that leave it? It's, it, it's a contradiction, right? Yeah, I was taught that that compulsion verse only meant you know becoming a muslim initially after you become the muslim that's out the window like now you're submitting yeah like totally your slave what what do um 
So when you when you said that um, you talked about slavery with his Tahrir, do, does his Tahrir defend slavery? Yep, they they say that it's part of Islam, um, and it will be a just slavery. It'll be like the way they talk it up. It's like it's not what what we picture in in our human history. This is like, you know, the way Allah pr promised it should be, and you know. But yes, yeah, so there's slavery. There's going to be concubines, and you know, if there's wars, and yes, they will take their women, and it's. I mean, you know. it's a it's a thing, you know. Whatever's in Islam, they just like, yep, that will be in there. Um, just to rant a little bit more about his Tahrir, uh, I'll tell you a funny story that happened. I was in university. I was Muslim, so I was, I guess, Salafi leaning. Actually, I wasn't even Salafi leaning yet. I was still like, just like most. I'm just Muslim, just Sunni Muslim, gen generic Sunni Muslim. And I was still trying to figure out whether Sufi, Salafi, his whatever, like, you know, Islamist, I shouldn't say his but like Islamist. I had Islamist friends trying to convince me about Islamic Brotherhood. And so one of my friends gave me a book of Said Qutub, you know, to read, um, which is very similar, let's say, to his but The oh, same. I, we had those books. <laughs> was, I read those ones. I think it's in the shade of the Quran, right? Something yep. like that. Yep. Yeah. So people people don't know Said Qutb is a uh, Egyptian that wanted to bring back uh, Islamic law. He attempted and, it, yeah, overthrowing yeah. the Egyptian government. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so so they believe so so there's definitely like uh, a tension among Muslims between people like like let's call them Islamists and. I don't know what to call the other guys, non-Islamists. So the, the people that are like more Sufi leaning, they follow mud hubs, they tend to like watch like Hamza Yusuf and stuff like that. Those guys clash with Hisbis. So yeah. at my university, there was one time where we had Munir Al Qasim. You might know him, he's from London as well. Yeah. Yeah. And he he came to the university. I don't even remember what he was talking about. And his Tahrir guys came and they started shouting at him. Oh yeah. And that's what they do. <laughs> that's they, what they, they did. They show up at even Muslim speakers and they, they yeah. heckle them. And you're a fake Muslim. And I remember one of my friends was told by another his member, you're not a proper Muslim. He was so mad. He was so pissed because they were having a debate about Palestine. And of course, my friend supported Palestine. I don't even know what he said that caused him to be labeled a Catholic or Munafic or something. But like, <laughs> that's the type of, this is the type of people we're dealing with. These people yeah. are like so antagonistic. Mm -hmm. And so there was a new, Let's call him his B convert. He was a he was a non-practicing Muslim that became his Tahrir member or like ascribed to the teachings, right? And I was responsible for finding someone to do the khutbah. And I I made the mistake of letting him do the khutbah, even though he was like fresh convert, whatever. Like not convert, but like he was Muslim his whole life, but he wasn't practicing and now he became religious. His khutbah was on why slavery is halal. <laughs> and wow. it caused such a big fight because the other Muslims started shouting at him after the khutbah saying how dare you say this slavery is haram and the other guy is like no slavery is not haram Allah never made slavery haram right exactly it's like it's like this tension is there right and and so you have speakers like Hamza Yusuf would come and they wouldn't necessarily call out his Tahrir but they'd say like things like these you know you have these Muslims that are putting the cut before the horse. They want to reestablish, you know, Islamic politically, but they don't pray Fajr or something like that. So did you hear about any of this like Fajr thing? Um, no. Like when Muslims will all pray Fajr. So they say, so So the, the, they'll say things like, you know, it's more important that Muslims play Fajr first and then we will win Palestine, something like oh, that. Oh yeah, right? that's like a Salafi way. Like it, you have to focus on Tawheed and then, as, you know, everything will magically appear. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. and then the, the Hizbis and the, the Islamists will say, no, 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 because Islam was strong mm -hmm. because we had the caliphate and therefore the non-Muslims had to respect the Muslims because if they didn't, you know, they'll send the armies and this and that, right? Yeah. So it's totally different priorities and perspective. Yeah. Um, and and so, like, definitely, you know, I think that talking about political Islam is important because political Islam is the worst type of Islam. Would you agree with that? Like, well, I mean, they're very clear about what their goals are. So, I mean, if that's like a problem, then we need to at least talk about it. And um, 
you know, whether or not it's inciting violence right now, it's, um, it appeals to those types of people. And um, when the end goal is, you know, to, you know, world domination, then <laughs> we should, you know, take a look at it. I mean, how how do they end up with such such goals? Like, where is this coming from Islam, or is this something they added on to Islam? Like, wh why are they? Why do they want like world domination? Let's call that. Well, it's because it's in Quran, because that's what Allah said that uh, Islam will reach all ends of the earth. So they're just like fulfilling, you know, their duties. So it's everything is Quran and Hadith based. That's why, like. After I left the marriage and I was looking back on everything, I'm like, I, I didn't just leave the marriage. I left the religion because everything in there was Islamic. So I'm like, so everything I did leaving was like away from Islam. So I couldn't, I couldn't uh, stay a Muslim even after leaving. Like I couldn't even. So, um, and because, you know, my ex is so vocal uh, about his views, um, I just I feel compelled to also do it, do this and um, explain what it's like. Because, I mean, when you see the world the way they do, I mean, it's, it's scary. I mean, when 9-11 happened and I found out, like, that these guys are just willing to just die like that easily for their beliefs so like that's that's scary you know and the way islam is set up and especially the way the hizb is set up um they're very um they teach you how to think in a certain way like they go through a process and it's very cult like like they teach you how to think how to process anything um, how to teach other people. Uh, I mean, everything that you learn from them, you, you can't even take notes. Like you have to just, you retain it and, and regurgitate it right back all the time. And um, it's, uh, you start seeing the world in, in a different way and it, it will make good, good uh, meaning, well-meaning people do bad things. And um, that's a problem. And we need to be able to address that. Yeah. But um, I, I sympathize with people that left and joined ISIS and want to come back because I feel like that could have been me. <laughs> so if there was a good way to figure out how to de-radicalize somebody, I don't know what that looks yeah. like, but I was de-radicalized. Like, I mean, I left, right? And I got myself out of it. And it was like a messed up psychological problem, like, changing my worldview back again was like i was going through what what ex-cult survivors go through and so you were Muslim for 12 years right you said 12 yeah. years yeah that's a long time so i had no identity like when i left like i i went right back to that 27 year old that that converted to them I, I didn't know who to be it was really weird um and so it's when you think uh like the way Islam is set up, like in an ideal situation, like you are chanting in Arabic all day long. <laughs> like you're saying the morning du'as, that like you're doing all the prayers and extra prayers and everything's in Arabic. You're um, reciting different things for entering different rooms. And every time you look in the mirror, every time you drive. So you have no time to think for yourself. You're like almost like a drone. <clears throat> so I, I just... I don't know what de-radicalization would look like for people trying to come back. If that's like, how do you even get, like, I, I don't know how to get somebody out of that mindset. It's yeah. just, we can't take away any of the things needed for when people do want to get out of it. And that's what's dangerous in, in Muslim countries, especially like if there's so many ex Muslims in Muslim countries and they have to fake it because it's so dangerous and um, that it shouldn't be a danger. To, to not want to, you know, go along with everybody. <clears throat> yep. Shouldn't, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I agree with everything you said that it's, you know, it is, I do think there are people who have joined, you know, ISIS or whatever that realize it's wrong, but I just don't, I don't know how we would ever bring them back into society because 
they've now you know they've joined this terrorist group so it becomes <clears throat> very difficult right um but yeah i do sympathize in the sense that like yeah it could have been me too we i could have ended up joining some group like that going overseas yeah. this this whole concept of hijra yeah it, com it comes down to us versus them thinking doesn't yeah. it yeah yeah and that's what you get caught up in um it's it's really weird like there, there's the muslims and the non-muslims so there's the most like believers and non-believers and it's repeated in the quran so much <clears throat> what happens to believers and non-believers <clears throat> excuse me and so you start looking at everybody especially when you're living in a western country like you are the outcast and the more like looks you get especially as a hijabi uh, you, you're feeling more and more and more like an outcast. And then there's like these hate crimes, like which has happened here in oh, London, yeah. which is when I was a hijabi, um, I was always scared like of things like that happening. Like I right away thought like this is like that can happen. So that only makes that division more um, apparent um, mm. in your eyes when you're um, very fundamental about it. But um I mean, we need to be able to address like what, like what would drive somebody to want to do that to somebody is just um, so horrific to be able to just kill somebody like that. But um, the the in a sense, you know, I'd say they're like two sides of the same coin. People like that and people like you know, that go to religious fundamental, like not necessarily fundamentalists, but like extremists, they both, you know, ha they both have very hateful ideologies. Yeah. Um, the Hezbo Tahrir ideology is not one that is actually telling people to kill people right now, which is why it can keep spreading, right? Because mm -hmm. if it was, if, if it was a little bit more extreme, it would be just cut off, right? So yeah. it, they found a spot where they can keep using yeah. um, and keep spreading in Australia. And, and the type of Muslims that... The, the the grooming are uh, the type that could potentially you know flip and join like yeah. a like the caliphate right because they've already been convinced i mean what convinced these people these young ladies and young men in london some of them highly educated to join isis was the fact that there's hadith that they've heard about that they've been taught about black flags yeah. you know, coming from syria yeah and um, i don't know what else but there's a bunch of signs or whatever right and obviously isis heard the signs too yeah exactly. <laughs> they read the same book so they're like black flag yeah, look. yeah and did you ever hear or were you ever taught that if someone calls for um if there's a caliphate formed and you don't join you will die the death of a ignorant of yeah. a child yeah that's why we were always on edge like that we might have to move one day but um they were very much aware of everything that uh, ISIS was doing to make sure, like, if they would be, if the Hizb deemed them the right one, we would have had to drop everything. Can, can you tell us about that? Like, what, what was that teaching about the what I just said? Can you elaborate on that a bit? Um, about the yeah, so, right, yeah. If, if there's a, a, a legitimate, like, according to them, a, a legitimate Islamic state, uh, you know, a, a Khalifa has been appointed, um, we have to move and support it. Like, it's very clear that, yeah, if we die uh, away from it, then we will die as a non-Muslim. So it was very, like, we were just like, you you know, be ready to just move within a week, one day. So we are, we were always, like, watching um, international news uh, about what's happening geopolitically everywhere all the time. And the Hizb not analyzes all of it. So we're always aware of like what's happening, especially when the Arab Spring happened. We're like, okay, is this happening? Like there might be a Khilafah pop up, especially when Syria was like a, you know, because of the Hadith, it says it will arise out of El Sham, which is Syria. And um, so we were just that. That was our ultimate goal. Um, our, you know, and and he, you know, said we should be praying to die as shaheeds every day. Like that's our, it should be our goal. It's, that's it's so scary to say that. Like, you know, you should be praying every day to die a martyr. I mean, and then if you are, are if you're scared of that, you have to feel guilty because that that's the goal of all the best Muslims, right? So now I, if I if I didn't want something that's the best thing for you, I was like feeling guilty and I'm like a bad Muslim, you know. 
Yeah. So yeah, whenever I showed like any sort of concern about bringing the kids over overseas, like I would be called just negative and pessimistic <laughs> and I'm not trusting Allah. Yeah. So like spiritual abuse is, is a really a, a, a problem <laughs> with um, Muslims, with this type of uh, household, I believe. Um, you're just kept in line through the religion, you know. Can you can you elaborate on that? Like spiritual abuse by that, what what you mean is using the religion to control like control the family? You yeah. Mean? I I think, you know, like you have to obey your husband, you have to serve him and do it um uh you know without complaining and always making uh him look better than he is, like <laughs> to make him seem better, like that kind of thing, like with my life, like constantly just you know, speaking up about him and, and making him look so much better than he is. And especially to my family, it was, I had to lie to them because after seven years, he got a second wife and I was oh, wow. close to the second wife. And I spoke to my parents almost every day and I had to lie about the whole thing. So she was just my friend. We had all this story that none of it made sense half the time, but like we just, I had to lie all the time and it was, really wore me down to like, but it's the us versus them, like they're Kaffirs. So, you know, we can lie to them and be deceitful as long as we're true to our Muslim family, which is a whole wow. different thing going on. It's just, um, yeah, the cognitive dissonance uh, is, is also like, you're just doing it with a smile because you have to, uh, regardless if you're falling apart inside, you know, and if, and if you do fall apart, like you're now being a bad muslim you know because you're not thankful so i don't i don't i mean i've heard of um men who get second wives but i haven't like heard the stories from a woman's perspective so what was that like so after seven years so you were you were married for seven years and then he decided yeah. to get a second wife yeah he told me from the beginning though that he would want more than one wife so i i knew it was probably going to happen um, and then when he start when he met somebody on a matrimonial site that w wants to be a second wife and all this stuff. And, um, as it became a reality, I was just like, okay, well, I had three kids already and, um, I just, I, I just stayed busy. Um, I was devastated initially because we weren't having like a bad marriage where we didn't get along and that's why he was doing it. He was doing it to just be more pious and, and do more. Oh, and, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, well, right. <laughs> so yeah, th this is how, you know, you make yourself yeah. feel better. And then I, yeah. I'm buying all these books written by, um, you know, polygamist uh, women and how they d go through it. And, you know, just like, this is my struggle. That's going to get me to heaven, you know, and I would be reassuring other sisters that would come over and cry for me. And I would have to like, reassure them and tell them it'll be okay. <laughs> I think it's just, Oh wow. yeah, it was crazy. I lost a lot of friends and I gained like the more extreme friends. And when this happened, um, I got to know how many people actually do polygamy because people don't talk about it. But once you are in it, then you're like, holy cow, like it's, it's big. Like there's a lot of Muslims do this. And so, uh, I'm just going to call out the elephant in the room. This is, this is illegal. So how do they how do they keep it legal? Apparently, it's only illegal if you legally marry all of them, which is impossible. So it's like a loophole. So yeah. they're just like, I just got all these girlfriends. Yeah. So yeah. So, so basically, the the claiming, if ever asked, you know, legally, these are my girlfriends. Yeah, just a bunch but of baby mamas. But Islamically, the actually wives because they've had. Yes, an they do the uh, they do the Islamic marriage like with two witnesses so it is actually a wife but it's right just legally the, just the not legally sort of dishonesty to to keep it yeah. legal right right and all of the second wife third wife all of them have no legal protection right right in your case did you do the legal like you you legally got married no as well? no no we didn't legally get married either so he so didn't, just... didn't want to register the marriage no no we just left it i i've heard of this and why, why, like, can you explain why did he, how did he convince you to do that? Um, I didn't really care because I, because I had met him and it was like spontaneous. It was almost like a way out. I'm like, well, we're oh, not going to okay. legally do it. We'll just do it Islamically. So it'll be, you know, it was just, 
it didn't matter to me. Like mm -hmm. it was just almost like a safety net for me. So did um, so there's a safety net for you, but normally it ends up being a safety net for the woman, the the marriage, right? Um, in terms of like acid distribution. And, well, you know, not necessarily like because um, if you're not legally married, you can keep things separate uh, oh, easier. Okay. So, like bank accounts, especially if you're coming in with more money, right? Right. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So, so did that affect at all the? That doesn't affect child support or anything like that. No, no, it doesn't okay. matter. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so why did you lose friends? I didn't get that part. Um, the ones that thought it was ridiculous, like. Yeah, but it's you not know. your fault, though. Oh, but like I was, you know. You were I supporting okay. it. On. Yeah, because I I was okay with it and didn't stop my husband from doing it. I like how a lot of people would come over and like think I can control him. <laughs> like, why are you letting him do that? I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I, I wish I could make him do things that I want. <laughs> like, how do you do that? <laughs> yeah. It's people that, oh my God. Oh, that's, that's, that's hilarious. Um, <laughs> yeah. Why did you let him leave Islam? It's like, it's like people asking people asking my wife why did you let him leave it's not like why he just own me like, that's yeah right it just doesn't make any sense it's like, it's, it's a oh. whole different... so so you're saying that there's a lot more people having second and third wives that that you do realize like like how common is this it's quite common i mean yeah. the, the people just do it and um sometimes they live in the same house sometimes they don't sometimes just so yeah. in your case how was it uh lived in separate houses okay so how was he able to afford two houses if i may ask like how is that possible i mean um, that's not well common, he right? he owned businesses and stuff and um and then child tax when you're having lots of kids there's mm. a good child tax so he's month, using so. The, the, the child tax from your kids oh yeah to, to fund his second marriage oh he that's the risk he doesn't care where it comes from risk is risk i had this argument with him he was like, it doesn't matter. Your sustenance comes from with whatever. Like, Jeez, so there's disgusting. like, yeah. That's slimy. Oh, man. That's supposed to be for the kids, not yeah. for to be going on escapades with yeah. other women, right? Yeah. Um, so you said you knew her. Yeah. So I Well, I befriended her uh, mm -hmm. to try to make it smoother oh, transition. Okay. And so the kids don't freak out and... Um, so yeah, we um, we became friends, um, and it was weird because we shared a husband. So you know, if we had complaints, we could like talk about it together. <laughs> so there's like weird things um, that you you know can help each other and stuff. But um, it, it was it was crazy like to try to live that life amongst you know, and, and lie to people about it. And, um, and then like, you'd get these men that want their wives to be okay with it too. So they would come over with their wives and try to make us like these, we would know, I, I knew what was happening, like some strange <laughs> couples coming over and then the wife sits down in front of me and the sister wife and we're, and she's like sitting there like terrified, like, because she's now being told how to become a, a polygamist basically and it's like i was so mad like these women don't want to do this like this is like one of the hardest things you could do and um so i i would just tell them like look like look at the bright side like you'll only see this guy half the time <laughs> you know like that's all i could say like look at the do your own thing you can demand some stuff it's like if i'm okay with this then i want this like just take advantage somehow i don't know but yeah there's like so, a lot of this. So just not to confuse uh, viewers, because some people are kind of saying surprised. This is still like minority within minority, though. So like within like very religious most. I don't know if non-religious Muslims would do it, but like within. No. It's within always the this, religious ones. Yeah. So within this group of religious Muslims, you have a minority that are doing it. Like in me personally, I knew one guy who told me he wanted to get a second wife, and I knew the Imam did it, but. Even in my circle, I didn't actually know anyone who did it, or at least they didn't tell me. And I was yeah. like, I was in the circle, like I was, I was one of them. So I wasn't like they would have no reason to hide it from me. I would say, um, yeah. but I think you're right that when you actually do it, then you know the people that are also doing it kind of be, will 
you know, the, it becomes a little mini, mini, um, like subculture yeah. inside the culture that, oh, these, you know, these, we're all together in this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Emotionally, though, like, okay, I, you know, I would say if you look at history, there the were a lot of polygamous marriages, but it doesn't make it any easier. And no. like from, from, a, from an evolutionary perspective, from a woman's perspective, or a man's perspective, let's look both ways. From a man's perspective, you wouldn't want your woman to be with another man because if she gets pregnant, then you're, you're raising someone else's offspring. And not that that's a problem per se, but if that happened, evolutionarily, evolutionarily, my genes would have been cut off. So that means if I if I didn't mind my raising other people's kids, I wouldn't have kids that would succeed evolutionarily, right? Yeah. Meaning the cuckold problem is, you know, men have evolved to want exclusive access to the woman because they don't want to raise someone else's kids. Because if they did, then they wouldn't they wouldn't exist because my parents would have, you know, the line would have ended. So it it, it that 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 tendency gets passed on. From a mm -hmm. woman's perspective, she wants her man to invest all of his resources, I'm saying historically, into the marriage, into the offspring, because if, if he goes and has other children with other women, then there's just that much less resources for the family, for your family, right? So it makes sense that a woman would not want her, her man to have another woman. It just makes perfect sense, right? Like I'm just saying like from an evolutionary perspective, but emotionally, okay. we're all hardwired to like, it's, 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 it's a very difficult thing to, to accept, right? Yeah, it is. I, I it was so hard. Like, um, I, I bought this really good book from a, an Islamic bookstore, and it was like going through like how the like all the hadith that the wives of the prophets um, pertaining to polygamy and like different things that they went through and their jealousies, and it just helped uh, help me get through. And I had to literally show him. Like, look, like this is hard for me emotionally. Like, you can't discount that, and because he's just like, you know, it's allowed by it's allowed in Islam, so you should just be fine with it. It's like, you know, I still have emotions. I would have to like go through all the emotions that I'm going through through with the book to prove to him that it's like a real thing. Like, he was just like so like everything. Like, if it's okay with Islam, then it's okay with Islam. Yeah, it's so. easy for easy for him to say that, being the one that's having the second wife. But I mean, yeah. like men should like i don't have a problem with polygamy but if a man should be allowed to do it then a woman should be allowed to do it too it's yeah. only fair like polyamory is a more equitable system now i don't think polyamory is for probably 99 percent of people yeah. but like islamic the islamic system is completely one-sided yeah the man can have multiple wives woman cannot have multiple partners yeah but like a man in that situation should think about it and say well if i'm like if I wanted to be okay with that, would I be okay with that? Right? And you can't say, oh, just because it happened, it, it's more common or just because it, in history it happened. That doesn't make it any easier to accept. And yeah. so the same emotions that she is feeling, you should be able to empathize with that if she did the same thing, right? Like at least have that empathy, right? Yeah. And and so exactly. these these women were coming to your house, you know, trying. The husbands wanted to convince them that, oh, look, this is so good. Like practically speaking, how was life with a second wife? She was in a different house, so you would see a husband half the time then. Um, yeah, so she lived on the same street. Um, we spent time together. We would cook together. Um, we like were pregnant at the same time. Um, I mean. Wow, it sounds insane, weird. <laughs> right? But yeah. like, I just dove in. I'm like, this is how it is Islamically, and um, just uh, yeah, it was. It, we, you know, there's like a, a TV show called Sister Wives that came out. We watched all of that to try to get inspiration on how to do this, like as a polygamous family. So. I mean, culturally, there's support <laughs> for this kind of stuff, whether or not it's Ill illegal, you know? Yeah. So I, I did my very best to to make the best out of every situation I was put into. Um, again, like I believed in Islam. So I was, tr again, this was my, my jihad in my life that I was going to, you know, go to heaven for, you know? This was what you were saying about spiritual abuse. It enables... Yeah. Um, situations less than ideal situations right exactly yeah. exactly 
And and what about your kids? How did they take it? Did they eventually accept this as well? How did yeah they they, they accepted it because I I was very good about not you know I, I was just like this is our family this is like we have like a larger family so they didn't know any different where it got difficult was teaching our children to lie to my parents oh and then we would have to explain like look they they won't understand because they're too far like you know <laughs> it's just like teaching little kids this this difference right it, it was very hard on them to have to keep secrets because they would go spend nights, you know, at their grandparents' house and stuff. So it's not like they they didn't have much relationship. They had a close relationship with my that's family. Good. Yeah. So that's one thing I'm so thankful for. My parents did not disown me amongst all this. And I stress that to anybody who's worried about a family member uh, joining Islam is don't cut them out. Try to keep them close so that if they need to get out, they you're welcoming to that. That's my advice. <laughs> Absolutely, because yeah. My parents didn't agree with it, but they they stayed by my side and and helped me. So, and and eventually you left it. Yeah, and, and they were there for me, even though I had been lying to them about polygamy. Yeah. Boy, were they upset when I told them about the polygamy part. But yeah. So, oh, um, going back to the what the whole um, us versus them thing. When you said that, you know, you felt like worried about, you know, being attacked and stuff like that. Um, my experiences were a little bit different in that other than when my wife wore niqab for a very short time, when she wore niqab, she started getting a lot more like abuse. Like there's a bunch of things that happened. Someone to can, can at her or something, shouted at her, go back to your country, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But other than that, for the most part, I think as a Muslim in Canada, we had muslims in canada we had a really good life like i look the same as i did i probably had a bigger beard even um you know i i do i am speaking from a position of privilege in terms not of money but in terms of education so i'm lucky in that i had you know i did my education here and i i did computer science so i'm in terms of education i i didn't have a hard time getting a job so it wasn't like they could have discriminated they could have still discriminated against me but it's a different it's totally different if you're like a factory worker versus yeah. you're working for amazon um, you're working as a tech techie guy right because it's, it's a different dynamic there but i was treated and and the other thing with techies is they tend to be more atheist and they tend to be more liberal right and so the, in my crowd people like they treated me with respect. They were like, yeah, he's kind of crazy. Like he's doing all these things that he doesn't need to do. Like my my boss's jaw dropped to the ground when I told him like, I can't get a mortgage. He was like, what? Like, how does that even make sense? Like, what does that have to do with religion? Like he didn't even get it, right? And then I told him like, I'm willing, I, when I said I'm, I would do this, I would rather rent my whole life rather than like upset God or something like that. He was like blown away. like. He couldn't believe it, right? Like he was just like, I can't believe you're saying this. Like this doesn't make any sense. And um, you know, these these guys had a good influence on me. Eventually, ultimately, the respect, the, the kindness, and you know, they questioned me sometimes. We had conversations. I was really open about religion. I'm like, yeah, ask me anything. Let's talk about it. And eventually, little tiny doubts you know, little tiny things that managed to like click in my head, which ultimately led, you know, open the stage for more and more doubts and more and more open questioning and being able to see that this, this, this is a facade, right? Like the canopy of Islam, which was th thick, it's like a jungle. A little bit of light was getting in. This little bit of light, right? Little small doubts. Um, one of the first things that actually got in for me was, one of my friends, um, it looks like we lost Debbie. Um, while while, she, while she, I'm waiting for her to reconnect, I will just uh, keep going on about my story. One second. Uh, da, da, da. Um, so, yeah, I'm just waiting. I just messaged her to come back. What happened with me was one of my friends an atheist friend actually sent me a study. And the study said that people that prayed for, no, no, I sent him the study saying that, look at this study, this amazing study, 
when you pray for people, they get they get healed faster. So in my mind, as a Muslim, that made perfect sense. When you pray for someone, they of course they'll get better because that's what prayer does, right? And um, I'm like, when I sent it to him, he looked into it. Turns out it was like a practical joke or something. One, it was the the study was not was made as like a kind of joke or something. It wasn't even a real study. And it turns out the actual opposite is true. Like the Harvard prayer study shows that people that pray, it makes no difference to the, the healing rate. And in fact, some people actually, it took them longer to get better, maybe because they felt anxious or something that someone's praying for me, I need to get better. Um, someone is asking, I'm just gonna go to the questions. Uh, can you please make a video about meditation? I can't meditate properly. I failed. I would recommend that you get the 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 waking up app by Sam Harris, um, or even look up any guided meditation on YouTube. Some of the guided meditation videos on YouTube I find kind of dumb. They're like, um, oh, you're back. I'm just hey, sorry. I think my internet failed. Oh no worries. I'm just answering a question on meditation. Um, okay. I was going to say some of the meditation apps. Uh, sorry videos are dumb they have music ooh, and they're like they don't even know what they're doing i i really like sam harris and the way he does it um very straightforward focus on breathing if you if a thought comes to your mind that's fine that's okay don't worry about it um and just 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 be aware that a thought came to your mind just get back to your meditation so back to to debbie um i was just saying that you know like befriending people is the best thing to do being respectful i actually felt as a muslim that life in Canada was good. I felt, I appreciated secularism because I felt like I'm allowed to practice my religion. I'm yeah. allowed to pray at the office. Of course, as a, when I was in high school, I didn't have the same respect. Um, I remember working at Walmart and they tried to they tried to fire me when I asked them for time to pray. They're like, what do you mean you need time to pray? Like, I should have just yeah. gone ahead and prayed on my own instead of like making, like asking for it, like formally or whatever. But, but the point is they didn't like it, right? It was like, you know, interesting um but but yeah i never felt discriminated i felt like as a as a muslim i'm a valuable member of society that society cares about my contribution and that that canada is better with muslims and and my i didn't have this us versus them as much as but here's what Tahrir, they tell people don't vote right like yeah. don't get involved in politics yeah no involvement with government or politics like so you don't join the police force or any army or government agency because now you're working for kufr laws you know so and voting is like very sinful so and also um not only that you can't donate blood right like i remember the weirdest thing so there's a muslim group that does a blood donor drive every year mm -hmm. the weirdest thing muslims were telling me don't donate blood because it goes to the army which goes to kill muslims <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah, or, or you're like helping non-Muslims, you're helping Kafirs by donating blood. And same with like donating organs, like it's not allowed because after you die, your body is not yours. So, yeah. I had a really tough time with that one. That, so talking about, I want to talk about cognitive dissonance. It, that was, that was like major cognitive dissonance for me. I was like, that makes no sense. Because it saves I'm lives. Dead. Yeah, and I'm dead. I'm dead, and it saves lives. Yeah. How can you tell me not to donate? I I could not imagine when my Muslim family member, my cousin, told me, "You can't donate your organs." I was like dumbfounded. I'm like, "There's yeah. no way." I'm like, "You're wrong." I'm gonna look it up, and I looked it up, and it was like basically what you said. There's people that say you cannot donate your organs. That to me did not click, and I think, I think in that case, I actually ignored it, and I still signed the the donor card. I even told my family members, "Yeah, donate my own." There's no way God, in my mind, this is when I took my own rationality over the religion. And I'm like, there's no way Allah would punish me for helping someone with my organs after I die. Right? Like, I know. That doesn't make any sense. That, that's like ultimate stupidity. That's like level of like Mormon, like cannot take blood transfusions. Yeah. That's like, that's like, you know, that level of stupidity. Like, okay. Someone's gonna die if you don't give them blood, and you're telling me your religion says not to give. Like, get out of here! <laughs> get out yeah, of here! Exactly. With your <laughs> yep, you have to obey it. Doesn't matter. 
um is there any other examples of cognitive dissonance that like you face i know sometimes it's hard to think on the spot of things that happened that like caused you but like what were some of the things you like challenged him with like that you know my wife used to ask me things too and i'd be like yeah islam says this and you kind of gloss over the stupidity of it but like was there things like that you can think of um yeah um yeah exactly yeah, exactly we're helping the wrong people um i mean i i remember trying to go to a woman who uh, she would teach um like helicas for women and i the marriage like for me was was difficult at that time and i wanted to go to talk to somebody about it and like so I, as soon as I started saying something to her, she she like stopped me and she like made me recite Quran. And she's like, that's the solution. <laughs> like, Shaitan wants to come between every married couple and you must seek refuge from Shaitan and this is what you have to do. And it's just like, okay. So everything just like went right back to re reciting and doing that kind of thing. So there was a lot of that, like, like real life, problems having to be answered by magic um that was just you know it's really difficult what was this lady qualified in any way for counseling or anything like no she was friend? just like this religious mentor okay kind of thing. i have yeah. had the exact same issue i have i was having some issues i went to talk to a friend and i realized how completely and utterly useless it was to talk to this religious individual because the only thing he could come up with was the the prophet did this and yeah. the companions did this and it was so useless it's like i already know all that i already tried all that none of that works it's more complicated real life is yeah. more complicated than your damn 1400 year old books and these like you know rudimentary examples that were like preserved over 1400 years it's it's more complicated than yeah. that life is more difficult than just the prophet did this and she said do this and like it's it's so it's like talking to a child trying to get a child to help you with your problems because they're not able to think real world they're not able to understand complex relationship dynamics and stuff like that yeah. um you know and and what what ultimately caused you know the the marriage problems would you say was it was it the religious things or was it just personal? Um, it was, uh, I guess for me, I, I had, uh, things were just getting really bad for me uh, personally because I wasn't getting any sleep anymore. Um, I had four kids, one with severe autism who didn't sleep at night. So then dealing with him and then um, dealing with the second wife and her kids too so we like we were just always back and forth um running around doing stuff um he was just busy with his his stuff all the time you know he would just come and go as he pleases um it, it was just i was getting really depressed and i told him that like i feel like there's something wrong and he wouldn't really say much about it um so he took her on a trip for five weeks uh, to look for a country to move to so they went to a whole bunch of muslim countries together and i was left with all the kids babysitting them all for five both, weeks yeah both her kids and your kids yeah and that ultimately did it for me like i i, I and i would go to like friends like sisters for help and they were like you're so stupid for letting him do this i'm like I tried to stop them from doing this, like that I'm not in any shape to do this. And they didn't care. They were just like, they just did it. So I just got in shit for allowing it. And so I, I like walked into an eMERGE uh, at the hospital, like saying like, I'm at my wits, I don't know what to do. You know, like it, it was just like me grasping for help. I, I didn't, it wasn't me just like trying to leave the religion. It was me trying to get help and I was not getting it. And um, <clears throat> I just decided to end the marriage or tell him that I want, like, leave me alone for, like, several months so I can figure things out because this is not working. Um, and then it took about three months of him trying to 
figure out why I'm trying to leave him and not leaving me alone. And um, I just ended up taking off to my parents with the kids and saying, I'm not coming back. And then we ended up staying in a shelter because now he was wanting to take all the kids from me because now I'm being bad, right? And um, yeah, so it was uh, just like a whirlwind trying to get out of it, the, the marriage, like get away from, just trying to, to get away from it. <laughs> like it wasn't even, and then just like working through it and the trauma of it and figuring out like this religion basically killed me. Like, Oh man. So you would say, I mean, clearly that Islam didn't make your life better, didn't improve your life as a Muslim woman you got the shit end of a stick basically right yeah and and like i would even argue i thought about this recently that even if islam did like we can let's say you can argue that islam improved women's rights let's just let's just say let's just say wouldn't you agree that christianity improved it even more by limiting yeah. the marriage to one man one woman i mean the whole not the whole no no divorce thing is problematic for sure i mean that that kind of that's stupid but i think that christianity is actually if you're comparing the two at least in terms of this rule a woman is better having one man as a not sharing you know sharing him with other women that that works better the reason why Christ islam allowed it is because it grows the religion faster yeah. basically it creates more little child soldiers that muhammad yeah. could eventually use to grow his empire and it's all a numbers game at the end of the day right yeah yeah, I, that's how I saw it. Like these guys with their multiple wives and they're growing like there's so many kids. I always say like, they're look, they're starting their own tribe. Like, because, you know, they're having like nine, 10 kids with all these women, like just easily, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so that's, I mean, this is what I'm trying to shout from the, the tops of this, you know, buildings that Islam is not good. It's not good for women. It's not good for anybody. And, you know, it, it Obviously, hearing it from your your perspective just makes it all the more real to hear from a Muslim, ex-Muslim woman, a woman that actually went through this. And the irony is that, you know, this guy telling me that my life is going to be miserable if I leave Islam and his own, his own wife left Islam. It's just like, you know, such cognitive dissonance to think that Islam is the cause of someone's happiness or not. Like it's yeah. even as a Muslim, I knew that there's more to it than just that yeah definitely you're just stuck like especially as a woman like you know you have to obey your husband whether you know you like it or not that's your first duty <clears throat> mm -hmm. as long as it's not telling you to leave islam or do something un-islamic but if it's within islam you have to so um again like um i think a lot of these isis wives were obeying their husbands and um doing their duty i don't know that's such yeah. a complicated situation but yeah. i just see myself in them so much that i really have this like soft spot yeah. for them that that maybe they're they're really trying to get away from it but again like it took me so long and i was just so thankful that i'm in a country where i'm free to leave a, an ideology if i want to so yeah, yeah. I, I do think uh, access to information and access to information is important because um, a lot of these countries, they, they try to block off access to, to Islam and I don't want to say anti-Islamic website, but anything that basically questions Islam. I know my blog, my little blog, I can, where am I? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they block my blog and it's like, I'm a nobody. Like I'm just some guy in Canada that's just talking about my experiences. I'm just a guy talking about my experiences. I'm yeah. not a researcher. I'm not some big shot that goes on TV or anything. I'm just some guy that's just talking about why I didn't think Islam makes sense. And they, yeah. they actually like the fact that they blocked my blog in like Abu Dhabi or so I think Emirates blocked me, Pakistan blocked me. It's it's just like how fragile is your worldview that you have yeah. to block little blogs from canada you know what i mean it's just like it's a joke it's it's yeah. such a joke um and and you know when when i was engaging with um this guy they they come across very um confidently that you know we'll debate anyone we'll talk to anyone we'll 
you know and but but the points they come up with they're so weak like for example um one of the points this fellow brought up to me was okay well if you well first of all he said oh you're another um what did he say you're another uh, i forgot anyways they come up the points they come up with uh so oh he said you're another Majid Nawaz that's what he said oh you're just like Majid Nawaz I know you people like you anyways so the points they come up with like like even Hamza Yusuf Hamza Yusuf's not Islamist but like Hamza Yusuf and like even you know your ex the points were so they're so weak they're like well if evolution is true then how did the human eye evolve even Darwin didn't know about that um well in the 150 years since Darwin said that we yeah figured it, we figured yeah. it out I know. We're not in the 1900s or Yeah, whatever. and we're not revering Darwin as the be all and end all of science. Like we progress like constantly. Yeah, exactly. It's not like science didn't end when he discovered Exactly. <laughs> That's it's just they, they don't get it. Yeah. yeah. And then and then uh so that was like like a like a very easy point and I, I told him like and you know he was sending me this like one hour videos of him giving khutbas and somehow that was supposed to convince me i'm like i'm gonna listen to you talk for one hour just just like make it quick get to the point but i did and it there wasn't anything of substance there it's like i think oh yeah so here's here's what he would do so when i would say something for example you know well allah has comes down to the lowest heaven every night like, doesn't that, does that make sense to you? I said, Allah's coming down to the lowest heaven, like Allah moves. He's like, no, 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 no. I, you know, they take the Ashari view that Allah, like you don't take it literally. So uh, it's unfalsifiable. So basically Allah coming down, it's just Allah's getting close to you in his metaphysical way that he's closer to answering your prayers. But, yeah. but the problem still, this problem still exists that if Muhammad didn't know about time zones, which he didn't, because obviously fasting is like 20 hours in Norway and it's like, you know, 12 hours in, or like eight hours in Mexico or something. Yeah. He didn't know about time zones. We know he didn't know about time zones. So you're, you're retro, you know, you're, you're basically fixing the, fixing the problem by in, reinterpreting a different way. But it's still possible that this is just a mistake, that he didn't realize there's different time zones because on a flat earth, there's no time zones. Yeah. The sun comes down and the sun goes up and it's nighttime yeah. for everybody at the same time. So Allah coming down could actually make sense because there's no inconsistency of him being down and up at different times. The problem is in a round globe, he has to stay down because it's always nighttime. Nighttime moves, right? Yeah. So that's like a logical problem in, in Islam. But if you if you take the Ashari point of view, then you don't have to worry about that, right? It's unfalsifiable. And so then I would point out things like this and I would say, well, Islam, seen, the Quran seems to have scientific problems. And he's like, yeah, but Islam is not meant to to teach us teach science. I'm like, okay, fair. But then it's still it's propagating those problems. He's like, yeah, but Islam wasn't meant to correct people's scientific inaccuracies. So so Islam, the Quran, wasn't meant to not only wasn't meant to teach science, but it also further propagated those issues by by using the same flawed language of yeah. like holding up the sky with pillars that you can't see of you know the sky being solid you know that doesn't have any flaws in it yeah exactly. of like like all of these things seem to be wrong yeah but it just only seems to be wrong but allah didn't want to it's like <laughs> it's like okay so allah is talking like a flawed seventh century individual yes yeah but but he knows better yes and this is this is this is convincing to you yes okay <laughs> i'm not yeah. convinced you just take it. Yeah, like mountains it's, as pegs as beach is saying. Like it exactly. none of this, it and it it's so artificially um it's so weak. Like the, the, the argument's so weak, but they still use it because some people just don't look into the details. Some people don't yeah. don't dig into the details. So they're like, Yeah, mountains as pegs, it sounds good. But like when you look into it, like you said, the scientific miracles, it all falls apart, all of it. And I think some people they want to have the cake and eat it too. They they want to use the scientific claims, but also say that's not that's not the only meaning. Yeah. So like it's kind of like well, make up your mind. Okay, if there's no scientific claims, then I'm with you on that. There's no scientific claims, but then why do you believe it? Like what's what convinces you, right? Eh? Yeah, exactly. That's like um, the that stupid challenge in the Quran saying that write something like it, and. Um, the, they'll just like deny it. anybody that actually tries and does it they're just like nope that's not right nope it's not like so like they can just say no to everything 
And that's exactly it. When I actually was debating him and I, I brought up examples like, like uh, for example, the Surah Fa Kaf, mm -hmm. they're like, no, 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 that doesn't count. Okay, well. Yeah, they just not? say no. Like it's it's written by someone that knows Arabic, that studied Arabic yeah. to a high level, to a university level. I know the individual. And it's it's perfect that it's there's no grammar mistake. It it makes fun of the Quran because yeah. they talk about whiskey and da dancing girls and and it's like they don't get it. They like uh, Farid made a response to it saying, "Yeah, but like you know, dancing girls with whales that doesn't make sense. Why would they wear whales or something? Or like you know, he he was hanged and then choked. You know, if he's hanged, he's already dead. Why does he need to be choked too? Well, the Quran does the same thing. The Quran talks about smashing and chomping and yeah. crushing and like." Do you guys not like? Do you not see the same thing? You're criticizing Surah Fakaf. Has the Quran has the same problems? Then yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, I just exactly. want to highlight the super chat because uh, I was generous enough to donate. His book the logic on sorting injustice Muslims face in China, Burma. God knows how many decades of Muslim world without. So, so this is something that his book brings up a lot. They bring up the fact that oh, Saudis are fake Muslims because they're yeah. not helping the Muslims, eh? Yeah, yeah, like they're not actually Muslim countries. They're just like, you know, puppet regimes put there by the West. Um, if it's an Islamic regime like Iran, they do that on purpose to make Islam look bad. I mean, there's always, like, if they say, go move to an, an Islamic country, they're like, there is none. There's yeah. no right. There's one. no Islamic like, country. They're, yeah, they're all just like fake. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah even Saudi is fake, uh, fake Muslims and... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Do they ever? I don't know if they boy. I don't think they boycott Hajj, but like the like, pretty much consider them disbelievers. The Saudis, eh? Um, yeah, because it's a kingdom. Like you're yeah. not supposed to obey a king. <laughs> you know the whole thing. But and like, the way like all the scholars are appointed by the government, and the scholars tell everybody to obey the government. So they just like you know just appeasing the Muslims. That's it. Uh, someone is saying she was in a cult, not Islam. What would you say to that? Yep, I agree. Not Islam? I, well, my form of Islam was very culty. <laughs> that's that's what I'll say. Like most Muslims that I, I meet were just like like the way I was a Christian, just growing up in a Christian family. It's not like I was um, adhering to... I did for a bit, but, you know, it, it's very culty the way the Hizb uh, conducts their, their daily life and how everything is structured around... Uh, the work of the hizb so like you're always in activism mode you know i would i would say that i mean i thought about this too because i don't like saying islam is a cult but the way i reconcile this is that the you are more or less in a cult based on how your islam is how you practice your islam so you were in a cult for sure yeah. i was Probably in a cult too, to some extent, a little bit less than you, but a little bit more than most Muslims because all my friends were Muslim. All my life was Muslim. Everything was yeah. Muslim in my life. Other than the fact that I worked for non-Muslim with non-Muslims and stuff like that, that was like my outlet that was not Islamic, but everything in my life was Islamic. So when I left Islam, I kind of lost everything. I lost all my friends, mm -hmm. uh, even friends which I knew for 10 plus years the all the religious we are all friends for islam so they didn't like one one guy told me who knew me since i was a, like like since i converted he said you know i'm not helping you move houses because i i was moved i moved houses i finally got a mortgage because now mortgage is not haram so yay i can get a mortgage you know, <laughs> the only thing the only thing stopping me wasn't financial it was i just couldn't do it because of of dogma so when yeah. the dogma is gone i'm gonna live my life now right so i got a house yeah. for my family and he's like yeah i can't help you move i'm like why um, well, even I was getting movers anyways, but he just happened, decided to tell me this. I'm like, wow. why? He's like, oh, because um, you have a blog against Islam. I'm like, oh my God, okay, whatever. Yeah. Like, so he stopped being my friend. Most people, most of the people in my life, you know, my wife lost like tons of friends because I brought her into this thing. And I, yeah. you know, all these Salafi sisters and not all of them are Salafi, but like a lot of, like all religious, whether they were Salafi mm -hmm. or not. There were like also non-Salafis too. Like one good friend of us was Sufi and his wife was, obviously the family is Sufi, right? And they, they were just as practicing as the Salafis. So some people make a, they misrepresent Salafis as extremists. They're not extremists because in that sense, 
they just have a diff they're just a different type of theology like the, they have different beliefs about allah they believe Allah has two hands, even though they're not hands like we have hands. Yeah. But they still don't listen to music. Even the Sufis don't, I know, didn't listen to music. M my Sufi friend wouldn't eat al zabiha halal because it was factory slaughtered. He wanted hand slaughtered. Yeah. yeah. So, like, that's extremist, if you ask me. Like, that's more extremist. Oh, we my had to only have hand slaughtered stuff as well. Yeah. Are you serious? We uh, we actually ran a slaughterhouse, a halal slaughter slaughterhouse for a few years. Ah, so, that's yeah. the reason why you only eat hand slaughtered because <laughs> there's yep. financial benefits to yeah, the family. We actually did it too. Yeah, hand slaughtering, crazy. I I think that was another cognitive dissonance point for me that when I learned that in Saudi Arabia, the chickens are slaughtered by machine and they have a they have a machine saying Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, Bismillah, like a tape recorder. Yeah. Like the tape recorder plays Bismillah Allahu Akbar and the machine slaughters it. And Yasir Qadi was trying to tell us in the class that I took with him, there's no other way to do it. There's too many people. There's just not like enough manpower to slaughter it by hand. I mean, to be honest, if they did it by hand, I think the, the price would be more representative of the of the animal suffering. And I think that'd be better actually, yeah. because then less people can eat meat. Meat would be more expensive. Yeah, That's It just doesn't thing. have to be like so abundant. It doesn't <laughs> have to be that abundant. It's not like our only form of food. Exactly, exactly. So as, as someone that's like, I would say ethically leaning towards veganism, I would I would say that's better. But they don't care about animals. None of this has anything to do with animal no, welfare. No, it's just about Allah's like ways and laws. That's it. Yeah, they make it, and 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 that is something that you know his is a little bit more mature about in the fact that they don't they don't uh, beat around the bush. They don't say that it's well. They'll probably try to do a, one of those have your cake and eat it two things where they'll say, well, Islam is actually good for you, and it's obedient obeying Allah but they'll also say yeah well it's not about good for you or not you do it because Allah said so it's not about coming yeah. up with like maybe we don't know the reason why maybe it looks bad but maybe it's actually good and we just don't know it right like that's kind of like the, the like the twisted circular logic they'll come yep. up with yeah good for you but we just don't know why yep exactly we don't know the wisdom of it always so um yeah that cognitive dissonance for sure when i found out that the machine slaughtering thing i'm like well machines are but you know uh, muhammad al sharif said yeah m what did he say machines are muslim oh uh, the machine is muslim yeah, that's what of he course said. Allah, yeah. Allah, Allah, Allah controls the machines or something i don't know like it it obviously like when you start looking into the details that's when things start falling apart when things st stop making sense when you realize that like okay there's a if you go to saudi any muslim country there's a machine slaughtering well what's wrong with machine slaughter then can yeah. why can i eat the meat here like what's the problem right um and it's it's just like you know it starts falling apart when you look into the details exactly um would you would you do you agree with veganism or vegetarianism or what do you think about that um i don't like the way the factory farms are run especially since we did own a slaughterhouse i did um like when i was a teenager we had a beef farm so i i have seen some really lovely beef farms they're not like these factory farms that you see um but uh i i prefer like you know go to a farmer and get get meat if you want something like ethically slaughtered because most farmers that raise animals like they treat their animals well like it's not like a like a factory like yeah so um yeah if you're worried about the ethics then i i don't i don't think you have to quit meat i don't think that's a necessity but i think we don't need it in the abundance that we have it right now i think that's completely unnecessary it's uh yeah it's completely unsustainable too because right. the like, of there's no need for us to have a freezer full of food unless yeah. maybe we we slaughtered something we hunted and it's supposed to last us a year that's the only time we should have like yeah stock well in, in my case with seven people in the family we definitely have a freezer full of food otherwise i'll be shopping every day but, <laughs> but in <laughs> terms of like life. yeah in terms of eating meat every day i would agree with you that like i still eat meat but yeah it's it's definitely good to have less and i i do think that if we went back to like what you said like buying from a farm obviously it'd be more expensive but then probably we'd eat less right and so that would be exactly. better um the 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 price of cheap meat is basically animal suffering that's yeah and on top of it like though if the whole world wanted to eat as much meat as we do it wouldn't it wouldn't work like people like the countries that are growing now rapidly like china brazil you know india 
if they were eating as much meat as we did, it, like it would be completely unsustainable because there's just not enough grain, there's not enough water. There's like we are living like way past uh like uh, our needs and and it's completely uns unsustainable. So yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. Um, eating less meat is better. Buying from a farm. Uh, not totally related to Islam, but just thought that was an interesting point. So mm -hmm. I, I'm going to share your channel again. Uh, for those of you who are joining us now, do check out Debbie's channel. Um, the link is in the chat and subscribe to the link is in the description as well. Uh, Debbie, what's your first video going to be on? Yeah, um, I haven't like decided exactly how I'm going to go about it, but um, I found the website that I read through and became Muslim through. So I feel like I'm going to go through each point, like all the miracles and stuff and like talk about each thing and be like, you know, this is what got me to say Shahada. So let's debunk some of this stuff. So I'm gonna. Which website was it? It's a. Uh, hang on. It's called. Is it a brief illustrated guide to understand? That's the huh? one. That's the one. How did you know? How did I know? Because I used to give out those books, and I also was convinced by them. <laughs> yeah. See, that's the one. So it's a hundred percent. I I had a feeling because um, yeah, that book is quite popular, and it it is compelling. The like the points they make. Yeah. Um, and it convinced me. So what what really helped me was actually reading. Um, there's a blog called Rational Islam, where okay. the guy actually debunks a bunch of points. And then uh, one of my good friends, uh, Pete, the rationalizer, actually went and talked and interviewed a lot of those scientists. Nice. Right. I know. Um, I've seen a lot of the debunking of the scientific claims. So it's pretty. Because I'm like, even when I was Muslim, I was like, if these things were. Um, you know, uh, if these scientific proofs were actual like scientific miracles, you would have like scientists flocking to Islam. They'd be like, you know, I have to be a Muslim. Like they would all be, but it's like, maybe no, 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 the two arrogant sister. You see this, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, 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 they get money to stay non-Muslim and they get money to fight Islam because Allah, shaitan is strong. Exactly. That's true. That's a good point. Actually, we, we do find like, you know, uh, people that study, like especially physics and stuff, they tend to be atheist or agnostic because, you know, at that level, you know, things just don't like, like even Einstein. People like to quote Einstein believed in God, but like he actually attacked the Bible. He said, yeah. "I can't believe that the the character of the Bible is a creator. It just doesn't make any sense to him, right?" And maybe he was deist, you know. Probably he was deist, but uh, you know, a lot of these, I think, and I think a lot of these scientists at that time would have become probably agnostic or atheist if they live today because the information that we have, the knowledge we have about the universe, it, it's so much more than like even Darwin. Before Darwin, like there was it was much more difficult to not believe in God because nobody had a naturalistic explanation for how we got here. After I don't evolution think was scientists would be allowed to even say they were atheists. So they probably just faked it even back then because like they lived in a government system where they would like off with your head if you didn't believe in Christianity or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, someone was asked, someone mentioned in the chat, it's way far back now, about uh, Keith Moore. Keith Moore is in this, in, in this brief illustrated guide, too. Yeah. And uh, my friend Pete, he emailed Keith Moore to try to get him to basically, you know, go back on his claim that the Quran is amazing. Right, or whatever he said, right? Yeah. Even though he didn't exactly say that, he carefully worded it that and and frankly speaking, like if anyone looks at the blog post I have on embryology, you can see that it wasn't really convincing what he said. It wasn't no. very impressive. He actually praised Aristotle as much as he praised the Quran. Yeah. So it's quite clear that I mean, I don't want to like say I know, we don't know for sure whether he got money from Saudi, but like obviously he never converted to Islam. Like what kind of excuses? Oh, my family is uh Christian, so I don't wanna like what like that doesn't yeah. even make sense like his excuse but yeah he refused to comment when uh when pete emailed him pete showed me the email he was really hoping before this guy dies he'll like you know set this to rest and yeah. come clean that the quran there's nothing impressive about the quran i mean the fact there's only one scientist that everyone quotes that's what i'm saying just the one like red flag hello one guy <laughs> like where's the other thousands of scientists that are like claiming the quran is uh you know and exactly. and um there's the there's another guy who I'm deeply grateful um, to that that made a blog called um, um, Oh yeah, Chronic Spotlight, and um, he he went into great detail of how 
the embryology basically copied Galenic embryology, seventh century Greek. And Muhammad didn't even come yeah. up with his own embryology. He was just coding what was at the, available exactly, at the time. Exactly, exactly. That's why, you know, you just see it for what it is once you get out. It's like, oh, yeah. like that was all available to him at the time. Yeah, and, and which is why now you have Hamza Suetis and these guys that are now moving past the scientific claims and they're trying something else. The problem is one by one, all of the claims are falling down. Like first it was, you know, the scientific thing. Now it's like the preservation is falling yeah. apart. The preservation claim is falling apart. The Arabic claim is just weak in itself because nobody can really confirm it. So what they have to say is the only people, the, what I was told was, okay, well, you can't understand Arabic. But the people back then could, and they thought it was a miracle. So you should think it's a miracle too. Exactly. It's like what? But yeah. that doesn't even make sense because people today can see the mistakes in the Quran. Like yeah. Arabic speakers can see, even even academics can see, can see the signs of copy paste errors. They can see the signs where the the even even like Hassan Radwan has beautifully shown how even uh, Muslim theologians like like Tafsir in the Tafsir yeah. they're like they're puzzled by the the. The, the language it doesn't seem to make proper sense right like some of the sentences in the quran are, are malformed yeah. so the, the the muslims have to come up with a way of making it make sense by like even they're like this is weird <laughs> that's not how you talk in arabic right and it's so not. yeah so when muslim and muslims have that issue then and then you have you know the sana manuscript that you can see like with the ultraviolet radiation the the the, the pretext that was wiped out and you can see that it changed the text changed and yep. this was not this was like probably a companion codex it's it was a, a a folio that you know common people couldn't afford this this was like the copy found in the in the mosque of sana in you know so like more and more evidence i think is coming up and you know for me it was alexander the great the syriac romance how it was like point for point exactly the same as this made up story yeah. that that made me lose a lot of faith and question a lot of things i just think that you know um, piece by piece is falling apart and I'm, you know I'm so happy to see that you were able to leave Islam how long has it been for you now um, it's been like I've been I got out of the marriage oh it's almost four years now it's 2017 and um, yeah and then yeah I guess three years that I left Islam oh nice a while yeah I just didn't even let myself think about it for for a while but it's 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 crazy like it's a whole different like diluted way of viewing the world like it's you have a whole different outlook on everything so it's just it's really like a cult in that way like you're seeing things that aren't aren't there absolutely do you want to do you want to add any final words or any advice to maybe other women were in a similar situation as you were in or anyone in general any, any final words you'd like to add um, I don't know. I just, um, I appreciate everybody's support. I think the more people that come out and speak out, the better. Um, I, I see it growing, um, so quickly, even just over the past year that I've been, um, dealing with ex-Muslims and these kind of things. So I think, you know, if I had been aware of an ex-Muslim movement back um, before I converted to Islam, I, I don't know if I would have dove in the way I did. So I think it's important for us to, to just be um, very vocal if it's safe. And I feel like we, like us living in a safe country, like we kind of owe it to the people who are, aren't able to. Um, that I, I can't imagine living in, in a Muslim country and just having to fake it and, and not believe any of it. It must be agonizing. So, um, yeah, I feel for you guys. And um, I think we should just speak out for their sake as well. Wonderful. Well said. Um, so, again, those of you who are new here, uh, please do subscribe to the channel. Thumbs up the video share the video with others as well um, so that more people can see it. I am trying my best to get back into things and be more active. Um, obviously, life is you know crazy with kids and work and everything. So activism is is a challenge to keep it going. But And I want to say thank you to all of, of my supporters, members of the channel. Those who are supporting me financially, especially money is never easy to come about. So 
for those of you who are donating and continue to support me. Thank you so much. Thank you to the admins. Um, we're here today, John Stopman. You're the best. Keep it up. Uh, thanks for keeping the chat clean. And, um, you know, we want Muslims to be able to come and listen and engage without, you know, hateful, dirty comments. And that's, that's I think, the type of community that I'm trying to grow. And uh, Debbie, appreciate you, you know, telling us about this. I know it's difficult for sure to talk about, um, you know, openly. Hey, I, I was dumb. I went through, like, I, I know you feel kind of like, how could I have done this? You know, sometimes yeah. you, like, it boggles your mind. Like, you know, how could I have fallen yeah. for this? Right? Oh my gosh. You know, so many times I would just like be like, what were you thinking? Like, what did you think? What, like, how did you think anything good could come out of that, that decision? You know, but, uh, and people ran to me and were like, what were you thinking? I'm like, I know I'm like, I'm working that out. Like I'm writing a book now and it's like really therapeutic for me to kind of go through and write out the different stages of like basically my indoctrination. Right. So it's, it's actually therapeutic for me to do that. So it's like, nice. I'm writing for myself as much as anybody else. When when do you think the book will be ready? Oh, I'm hoping by next year I can have things published. So just awesome. uh, yeah. Um so when you when you do get to that point, um you should come back on the channel and we can talk about the book. It'd be good uh good way to get it out, get the word out. Yeah, and thanks. uh and uh definitely appreciate the what you know, sharing your story, especially some of the more you know, personal difficult details to talk about being a being a first wife and a second wife relationship. That's that's tough to talk about, and um, you know, it's important that people know that this is quite possible as a Muslim woman that you could end up in a situation like this, and you know, the spiritual abuse will be used against you. Yep. You will be told this is the Islamic way, just like you know, Mormons are. Actually, Mormons, I don't think do. I don't know if Mormons do polygamy anymore. But you know, the cults out there that or the, the religious groups that still do polygamy, they use yeah. religious indoctrination to try to convince the women that oh, this is good for you. God loves you, and this and that. Yeah. And um, it's it's the same story, right? Like men using religion to control women. And um, so definitely appreciate that. That was tough to talk about. Um, and yeah, for those of you who. Uh, we're just joining again. It's over, but do check out the stream is going to be live later. It'll be on Spotify and all of your podcast um, platforms as well. Do check out Debbie's channel and she's also on Twitter. So those are the two places you can find her. And uh, once again, thank you everyone. And uh, we'll thank you. Sp speak to you soon. Uh, bye for now.